Um, so thanks for coming along to my session. Uh, my name's Jordan Knight, and um, this is a Silverlight session, obviously, and I'm hoping to present to you guys today something a little bit different. Um, I'm hoping that some of the concepts I present today are going to um, be entirely new to some of you, and hopefully that then, you know, interests you in taking your development in a slightly different um, direction. And for some, for also equally for, for the rest of you, I'm hoping that um, what I'm presenting on today, like either furthers your ideas in a certain direction, or um, <clears throat> um, you might have already been thinking about some of this stuff, and I'm really hoping that uh, you'll come up to me and have that discussion. Like, so I'm, I'm really hoping to start a discussion out of this stuff that I'm talking about today. Um, thanks. Uh, I should just say very quickly, th thanks everyone for having me along in uh, New Zealand again. Um, last year, uh, I think I was the, the newbie uh, New Zealand presenter, so they put me the morning after the, um, the, the drinks, the, the party. It was at 8.30 in the morning. So this year I promised promise you I'll be a bit more sprightly. It was quite a, quite a shock to the system. I wasn't quite prepared for how good the, uh, the party would be last year. <laughs> um, so it's good, to, it's good to obviously be presenting on the first day and everything like that. Um, I'll leave that there. <laughs> so um, just a little bit about me. As I said, my name's Jordan Knight and I'm the uh, solution architect for a little company I run called uh, Xamling. Uh, we've been running for about four or five months now. Uh, you might have seen some of our work this morning here in the keynote. Basically, we built the, the Surface phone, um, all that sort of stuff, that, that, that demo there. Um, now, Nigel said that we did it in 21 days, which wasn't entirely true. It was actually uh, 20. So, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, fair enough, 21 days, fair enough. Um, and so what I'm actually going to do today is run you through some of the ideas that I've had, you know, in order to be able to build applications that quickly. Um, uh, you know, like I'm sure I'm the only developer in the room who who's seems who's seems to think that deadlines are coming, you know, um, sooner and sooner. I'm sure none of you guys have that problem. I'm sure you've got plenty of time. Um, so the best way to contact me is on Twitter, probably at Jack Edge, um, and you know, I've got some business cards up here as well. If anyone wants one of those, uh, you can also email me. And um, I'm also a, a Silverlight MVP, as is my business partner, who's also my brother. Um, and just a little tidbit, so uh, we've got two brothers and then we subcontract out to the third brother, so mum's, mum's proud as punch. <laughs> so as I said today, I, I want to present to you, I think, a little bit different way of thinking about building Silverlight applications. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about for quite a while now and I only just had the excuse in the last sort of five or six months to actually put into practice. Uh, over the last few years before I started my business, I was a senior consultant in a company in Australia called Redify. And basically, I would, um, for, those, for, for most of that time, I was actually um, consulting only in Silverlight. So and it was a really interesting time because we were able to go um, you know, between a lot of different projects. We get to see the really good ways that things are done, the, you know, the bad ways, obviously, you know, what sort of obvious stuff you get when you're a consultant. Um, had the opportunity to go file a new project on some pretty decent sized projects. So you know, we have the opportunity to do greenfields as well as coming into projects at the end of their lifetime um, and seeing you know, what's been done and help fix things or you know, just help get it over the line. Um, another benefit is that you can go back to a project six months later and, and you know, find out how it all worked. You know, that thing we tried, how was that? And you can see that, you know, the, the areas of maintenance difficulty, um, you know, any pain points that might have come out of that and anything that really worked as well. So what I'm going to do today is, I guess, group all that sort of stuff together and, um, and present to you a little way that I do things in Silverlight and then further, further into the session I'll present to you a little framework that I've got up on Coplex that'll um, at, least, at least be a guide um, for when you're building uh, Silverlight applications. Um, so I think um, any, any decent Silverlight application that's out there these days should probably be using the, the model view view model pattern. Now, this session isn't actually an MVVM session, although it, it certainly uses MVVM as part of that, and I will cover it off for those of you who, um, who, who are familiar to it. But what, it, what, what this session is more about is, so I've sort of got MVVM going. What do I do next? So I've got, I've got this problem that I've solved, um, that MVVM solves, and we'll go through everything that that helps with it, uh, soon. But I've got this other problem that comes along a little bit after that in that, you know, I, I don't know quite how to properly do you know, navigation between views and how to do view selection 
um, and all these sorts of concepts that I think people don't talk about enough when they're, um, when they're considering their applications. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to run you through some, some demos that I've got and basically um, they're really, uh, so, so I'm going to basically start from scratch on how I would do this stuff um, and show you how I do view selection and navigation, um, transitions and things like that. Um, and I'm also going to run you through a couple of apps that we've built as well just that, that show this, dem this that demonstrate this stuff. Um, and no, I won't be busting open the secrets of how all that crazy stuff happens on the, um, happened on the surface this morning, but you can rest assured it was real. Um, so basically the MVVM pattern, um, is anyone in here using it at the moment? Is it, are you guys familiar with that? Yeah? Cool. So everyone else is, is not familiar with MVVM at all or no? So you just, nothing? <laughs> um, well, basically, the MVVM pattern, I mean, it's, it's not something you sort, of, you sort of download and install. I mean, given there are frameworks that you can download and install, or, or sort of, you know, helpers and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's more, it's more a description of a, um, of a solution to a problem, so a pattern. And what that means is that if there can be a lot of ways to do MVVM. There's no really right way. And there's also a lot of stuff that goes around MVVM, and, and I think it's the same with any design pattern that you need to consider if you're going to really get the most out of the actual pattern itself. So there's a lot of the ancillary work that needs to be done as well around it to make sure that you really are you know, building your application to get the most efficiency out of it. So MVVM itself, I guess the, rule, the basic rule of MVVM is, is you've, got, you've got your view, which is what the user sees, so your XAML and things like that. You've got your model, which will be your data and your, um, you know, your database calls or, or your web services calls and things like that, and any business processing and entities and things like that. You know, so you might want to calculate account totals and things like that. That will all be in the model. So the idea with the model is that, first of all, it should probably be reusable if it's a Silverlight app or you're running it on the server or anything like that. So you know, all those sort of business style calculations, they're the things that, you know, if you had, if you had three people in a team, right, you've got someone, you've got a designer, um, and you've got somebody working on the view model, so munging this stuff into Silverlight, you could almost have another person that could com be completely working separately without any idea of what you're doing in your views um, in Silverlight. They can just be building this stuff, and you should be able to pick that up and hopefully bring it across in Silverlight. So the model's over there, and, and basically, um, on the other end of the scale, you have the view. So the designer, this is something the designer's concerned about, and basically, um, sitting in between those, those two areas is your view model. So the idea of a view model is it will actually pick up and, and I guess consume the model. So it will go across and it will say to the model, hey, can you please get me a record? I want record ID 26. So you can see it's almost like the thing that causes the action on the model. Um, and then what it does is it takes the data and things like that that it picks up from the model and exposes them in such a way that the view is able to data bind to it. So it exposes properties. If you were to have a look at a view model in its most naked raw form, it's just basically a class that goes and does a little bit of work. Um, maybe it's in, in charge of things like loaders and just little stuff like that. And it will expose any, all of that data via properties because in Silverlight, data binding has to be done against properties. Then on the view, basically all that they're left to do is they just go and consume those properties. So you tell a designer there's this property and this is what it has in it, a list of strings or something, and this is its name. So you might have a little naming convention or something like that. And then they're able to go away and um, pick that data up. So there's one very important rule in amongst all of that, is that you've got view, view model, and model. The data flow can go, from, uh, can go across, so it can go from model to view model to view. But the knowledge about the objects and things like that can only go the other way. So for example, the view knows about the properties that the view model exposes. But the view model doesn't know anything about what the view has, and it shouldn't. I should be able to bring up that view model and instantiate that class without any view attached to it whatsoever. It's very important. And this is part of why the MVVM is so good, because it's a great separated presentation pattern. So it keeps everything unconfused. It keeps it all separate. So that way, if you're a coder, you're thinking about code. If you're a designer, you're thinking about design. And once again, the model should obviously know nothing about the view model because the model could have been developed entirely separately. So the view model, it's okay for the view model to know about it. Like it can certainly go and call methods and things on the model, but it just can't go the other way. It's a very important concept. So that's basically the rules, I guess, 
around MVVM. Um, and obviously it's, uh, sorry, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention the whole pattern has been designed based around the, the binding abilities in XAML. So um, it was actually created for, during the time when WPF was first released. So it's actually, and then obviously trans, trans, um, transitioned across pretty good to Silverlight as well. But I think there's a couple of other things that are really important to remember when you're actually building up, building up your Silverlight projects. And I think, um, you know, these, these might be pretty obvious, uh, I guess, little rules that you should use whenever you're designing any architecture, but just like a reminder of them now. Firstly, it needs to be simple for designers and developers alike. So if we're a, des if we're a designer, we want to make sure that we've got that design time data and things like that working. So then when they're in blend, the app doesn't just look like this empty hole with no data, no data in it. It can be really, really difficult to actually build an app that you can't see. You know, one of the, you know, the problem where they can't see the text box until runtime because that's when it gets populated with data. So there's something there that we need to really think about um, in that we want to make sure that even in Blend, that text box has data. And there's all sorts of things you can do in Blend around design time data and things like that that I won't go into today. Um, but there is another benefit there. Because we're not tying it all in with code, um, and we're using data binding instead, so it's all late bound, it's all, it's all dynamically bound um, at runtime, is that we are actually able to switch in and out that design time data at runtime automatically. So we don't have to really worry about having two modes for our application. We can just build it that way. The other thing too is um, we want to make sure that when we're building our architecture in Silverlight, we don't want people to come across and all of a sudden go, you know, oh my God, I've got to deal with these views and I don't know how to do this and I, I don't know how to transition, like I can't figure this out, like it's all different. So if, I, if I'm making a, um, an application, or sorry, a framework or, or an architecture for, 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 some, for a team, I'll make sure that the, that the guys that are actually going to be using that architecture can develop as if normal against it. So there's not this, all of this you know, sudden extra esoteric knowledge that they need to pick up on this framework just because they're in Silverlight and need to be able to do all this stuff with views and things like that. Um, which can sometimes be left on the back burner, I guess. So up there, we've just got a really simple example of MVVM. I'm sorry if you can't see that, guys. Um, it's actually not a piece of code that you're meant to take away. It's more just for um, aesthetics. But um, basically, um, I can see over there on the right, I've got a text block that's binding to a property. Um, and on the left, you'll see the I notify property change stuff, which we'll run through in a minute, which is sort of something that if you've done much MVVM stuff, you'll be very familiar with. But what I really wanted to get to today is, so what I know MVVM, and given a lot of you in the crowd won't, um, and I think that the MVVM, if you scour the internet and blogs and go to the sessions um, during TechEd this week, I think you'll be able to get enough of an idea about it without me having to you know, run through it again here. I really want to get a concept in, you know, going on in your minds about how, how you might do the stuff after that, as I said. So, you know, what next? And this is a problem I'm asked a lot, and, it, and I see projects that struggle with this at the start have huge issues at the end on how to actually you know, make these apps grow and scale and become more complex, and above all, maintainable. Um, so uh, I think it's very, very important to think about this sort of stuff up front. So one of the concepts I'm going to be talking about today is view selection. Now this, this is the problem where you've got, an app, very rarely will an application have a single view. So most of the time applications will have a, a range of views. So for example, you might have the welcome screen, which then transitions into the login screen, which then you know, transitions into you know, some sort of other welcome screen that's after login that's got some, some sort of user information in it. Excuse me. Um, so, Transition, I mean, so view selection in the past has been a problem that I don't think people have thought about enough. I mean, because if you're doing a Silverlight application and, and you might have used the built-in navigation framework or something like that, it actually appears on the surface to be very, very simple to do. Uh, there's a number of ways. You can either navigate to a view using the navigation framework. Um, you, can, you can use, um, you can just place the content into any area on the page, so, and you can load you know, you can switch things in and out dynamically using Silverlight. And I think the most common way that people are doing it at the moment, especially with Windows Phone, um, making such a prom bringing navigation back to the forefront, is that they're using the built-in navigation framework to do view selection. Um, 
Now, there's nothing wrong with the built-in navigation framework, but I'd just like to describe a, a way that I think scales a little bit better than that. So normally, the way that, that you would do view selection is you would do view first selection. So basically, you've got a user control in Silverlight that you then want to show. So you load that user control, and you place it into your screen. That sounds like a pretty normal way to do things, right? Like, I mean, you, you've probably, if you've done much Superlight work before, you've at some stage either created user control or you've navigated to it. The way that you navigate to it in the navigation framework is that you have a hyperlink button that then has a UR, basically a URL, a bit like a web link, to that page, and then the navigation framework will automatically pick that up and, and navigate to it for you. What I'd like to um, do instead today is instead of having this view first style navigation where the view's shown and then we worry about how to get data into that view and how to rig up any view models or anything like that we have, is I would like to um, show you guys and talk about how to do model first navigation. So we actually navigate to a model and put the problem of view selection across the, the, model, uh, across the view model divide back into the views and have it automatically do it. And there's a couple of really great reasons for that. Um, first of all, uh, I can code in the back in the, in the view models, like um, I can say I want to go create a new login view model and then just navigate to it and then get the result back from that without caring if there was a view shown or anything like that. I can completely ignore it. So all of a sudden I'm starting to code. It's forcing me to code with this sort of agnostic um, uh, attitude towards the view. I mean, obviously, we, we still need to be uh, conscious of its presence because we need to expose things through properties and things like that. But we can almost code up an entire application as if it was in a console app and then worry about the views being thrown across to the other side. So the first problem we need to do is how do we take a, a view model and then select the view for it? Because the model's the thing that's, that's controlling the navigation now. It is the object that we're navigating to in our framework. But when we do that, We've removed, a, we've removed a pretty big problem that I think ha that people have when they're scaling out their Silverlight applications, and that is view selection and having to worry all the time about how to get between these views. The second uh, concept that we'll be talking about today is uh, navigation. So we've, if we can do automatic view selection by navigating to a model, surely we can um, maybe keep track of which models we've been at, and then if we want to navigate back, we can just start you know, popping them off a stack or something like that. And then, once again, we don't have to worry about view selection. We don't actually have to save what view was actually being shown. We just save the objects that were there. They've got their state and everything. They're little. They're little view models. Um, and then when we navigate back to it, once again, it goes, hey, I need to find what view to show, and it automatically does it for us. So all of a sudden, navigation back and forward through our application becomes really, really simple. Um, and navigation is something, especially with Windows Phone 7 apps, can be, become quite complex. I mean, we've all seen Silverlight apps, uh, sorry, we've all seen uh, iPhone apps that, you know, these days they're coming with a lot of screens. I don't know if you guys have used Echo Phone or anything like that, but you can just keep drilling through to, for more detail and more detail. And then all of a sudden you've got this problem on how do I keep track of, you know, how to navigate back and how do I keep the states and everything like that. Um, which becomes very easy if you're using just objects and then just letting the view, the view stuff do it for you. So there's navigation. Um, and I think also one other point on navigation is that it should be very intuitive and it should be very, very easy and unscary um, for a, a developer to jump onto your project and think, hey, I know how to navigate to something. There's something I know that's there. I know how to navigate to it and I know how to use it because all of a sudden we've defined an API on how to navigate to something so they can copy some other code they've seen lying around in your project or they can figure it out based on the um, method calls and things like that. So we're introducing pattern and practice into things that, I mean, like what could be seen as quite a complex um, uh, problem, we, we can introduce pattern and practice in how to actually do that navigation. Transition is the other thing I want to talk about today. And so if we're going to go between two views, we're going to want them to sort of slide in and out. Or on, if you're on the phone, you want to do that 3D effect. Um, now, using the inbuilt navigation framework, you'd have to do that on every view, pretty much. So basically, you've got a view and you want to navigate to it. You'll start a storyboard on, in the onloaded event for that view. Um, and then once that's completed, you might be ready to do some processing or something like that or, or, or viewing. Um, and if you've got 45 views, and that's a lot of 
animation that your designer is responsible for, and then inevitably, project manager or something like that's going to ring up and say, "Hey, we want this change done to the way that the transitions work," or something like that. And it's like, "Oh, god damn it!" Um, uh, inversely, uh, sorry, similarly, um, there's another problem with transitions in that in that framework is that you, start, you you might need to know how to do a reverse transition. So I've gone to a screen, hit the back button, and all of a sudden you're like. Well, now I've got to figure out if I was already at this view and you've got a list of tracking to do and everything like that. Whereas if you've got a list of objects that you've already been to and you press the back button, which is of course centrally managed, you can just say, was the object already in the stack? Well, I've just done a back navigation. Well, look at that. It was already there. I'm just going to tell whatever's managing the transitions um, that it, there was a back transition instead of a forward one and it can handle that automatically. So, you know, back of course being sliding from right to left instead of left to right or doing a reverse 3D transition or something like that. So all of these things, these three concepts, the, the view selection, the navigation, and the transition will happen in, in slightly different areas. So the navigation, uh, sorry, the view selection and transition, we'll, we're going to push across the divide into the view. So that way, all we're worried about is actually navigating between objects in our view models, and just that, and that way we were able to, um, you know, really separate the concerns for all of this stuff, which is something that. I don't think it's done enough, especially when it comes to such view styled things like transitions and I think view selection. I mean, it, clearly to me that belongs across in the view side of things. So transitions, um, they really need to be centrally managed so they can update them, obviously, but, um, or else you're going to run into this maintenance, this instant maintenance debt there that I can see, like a huge maintenance debt. Um, and they also need to be, of course, automatic. So. I just want to be able to navigate to an object and have it handle the rest. I don't want to have to think about it every time that I want to add a new screen. It becomes a little bit scary to actually add a new screen to your app. You've got to do all this extra work and probably there's some document on some server somewhere that you need to follow to be able to do that. Like there's this whole design thing. Whereas I'd rather build all that junk into my architecture and have it forced upon whoever's doing it. And then they don't have to read that document. They just do it. If there's a problem with it, we fix it in that center spot. Of course, the transition should also be templated, and I'll show you guys how to do that today. So you know, it's really easy to actually for the designer to go in and actually make those transitions and decide they want to do a new transition and things like that. Um, now, I just want to do a quick call out. We're probably going to have enough time today to cover it, but um, I think any good framework should really look after the way that you are going to tombstone your application. Now, this is a new concept in Windows Phone 7. If you pop up an external web browser or something like that from your app, um, what's actually going to happen is that your app's going to be shut down. There's no background processing on the Phone 7 at the moment. It might come later. But basically, before your app shuts down, it gets the opportunity to serialize its state. So it's able to say, oh, here's everything I've got in memory at the moment, and then you know, it figures out how to go through and saves it off. And then when the app comes back, you can actually deserialize that state and bring the app back as if as if it was running in the background, but it really isn't. The problem with tombstoning is that it's completely up to you to do it. So you've got all these objects going everywhere, you might have some history, you might have all this junk going on, and all of a sudden you've got this problem where I need to save this state. So I think it's important to think about this up front. And although I probably won't be able to get to it today, the actual framework that I've, I've got up on CodePlex does, does look after a lot of this stuff for you, so it makes it a little bit easier to do. <coughs> So, uh, in a moment, I'll be finished on the slides and, and talking and junk like that. But um, basically, the way I'm going to pull this together is in two sections. First of all, I'm going to show you how to do it using the basic controls of building the Silverlight. And when you see me build out some of these concepts, you'll be like, you know, that actually really makes sense. And I've only done a few lines of code, and it's actually been really easy to do. And I think whenever you're building any framework or architecture or anything like that, simple is best. So, um, you know, make sure you use and extend the building controls, which I'll be doing today. So. If you've done any Silverlight development before, you should recognize the controls that I'm using today. And if not, they'll be the first controls that you see when you go into Silverlight development. Um, and also, just because you've decided that you're going to you know, roll your own MVVM-style framework, don't reinvent the wheel. Make sure you go out there and find the best one that, that suits your needs. I myself like using the MVVM-like toolkit. Um, and now this is for things like commanding and event aggregation and everything like that. There's a lot of other stuff in there, but I use it just mainly for the main, the main pieces. OK, so let's start off with a little bit of a MVVM refresher. Um, so basically, 
uh, what an, a view model at the end of the day is just a class. Um, it's a class that uh, will expose a set of properties that you then set into the data context in your view. And now anything that's set into a data context in Silverlight, like you're able to bind against. So if I set my class here, which is <laughs> my mouse rolls down the thing and it goes onto my little Windows 7 hidey thing there. Um, so if I actually set this, this class into uh, the data context of my view, you see it's, it's got a public property there that I'm able to bind against. Um, so and I might go and have a look in my view over here, which is in the one view. And you can see here it's binding against title. So by exposing a property, I'm then able to data bind against that property. It's a, it's a relatively simple thing to be able to get going when you first start um, uh, working in Silverlight. The other thing too is that um, properties can be updated dynamically. So if I change the title at runtime, um, I need to actually push a little notification out into the view saying, hey, that this property's been changed. So the view models will often in implement a base class that has implemented on it the iNotify property changed interface. And basically that just says that we have this property changed um, event um, there that we can raise. And then whenever we change a property, we basically have to tell, you know, that, uh, tell the view that, hey, that, that property's been changed or else there'll be no effect seen in the actual view. So if I go down here, you can see when I've actually set the, um, uh, set the title, I've called an on-property change just to go and you know, make sure that title updates. So that's about all I really want to show on, um, on the MVVM stuff at the moment. I mean, we're going to be using it throughout the demonstration. You pick bits up. And if you want to come up and ask more questions, I'm happy to go, happy to go into this. This is a level 300 session, so um, I, don't want to, um, I don't want to hang around too much on the really, really basic stuff. Um, so but basically what I've got in this, app, in this sample application here is I've got a couple of views. I've got one view and two view. Now I'm going to separate my views into two buckets. The first bucket is going to be content views. So they're the actual, uh, sorry, yeah, content um, view models, sorry. So one view and two view each have their own view model. And these are content view models. So they sort of, they sort of live alongside the views themselves. And we'll see why that is in a second. The other type of view model that I have is actually the, um, is what I'm going to refer to as a frame view model. Now the frame view model, which in this case is main page, um, basically takes the content views and provides them to the, to the view framework that we're going to be building to be shown. So the frame view will be responsible for navigation and we're responsible for taking the view, the view models and spitting them out into the, across the view model divide for, actually, for actual display. Um, and at the moment, my frame view model, just in its constructor there, it goes and creates a new one view model here. And then it goes off and sets the current content object, once again with the non-property changed here. So that way you can see that I'm actually going to, at some stage, probably be using some data binding to actually hook up to those view models. Um, so at the moment, this is looking pretty simple. It's a very basic view model that just exposes another view model through um, a property. So it's the frame view model that takes the content view model. What I've got here in my main view, my main view today is going to be the frame that's going to show all the child, the child um, content. Now it's very important, um, I'm going to introduce a very important control if you haven't used it before, and if you've used it before you'll instantly know what I'm talking about, and that is the content control. Now the content control is basically a way for, an applica uh, for a piece of data to be taken and then a template applied to it and styled up and everything like that at runtime. So it's like a, a way to dynamically take an object and show it on the screen at, at runtime using a template. The templates can be interchanged, which is, a, which is an interesting point that we need to worry about. Um, because if we're going to change the object we're showing, we're probably going to want to change the template too to suit it. So what I've got here is I've basically got, um, I've just started off my own custom content controls. So I'm going to reuse this control to actually go and make my navigation framework start off. Now at the moment, um, you can see here, it's just, it's just got bound into it, it's content, the current content object. So whenever that current content object changes or anything like that, um, out of the view model, this content control is going to take that and um, hopefully update its display. And at the moment, the transition content control is just a basic empty content control, so it's not actually doing anything at the moment. So it's very, very simple and basic. So I'm just going to run this up. And um, the first thing we'll notice is that the application, um, you can see that the content control is actually trying to show my one view model. 
but doesn't have a template or anything like that um, to be able to show it. So at the moment, the view model isn't being linked back to the view. So I might just um, I might just go in and, and just just very quickly, I'm just going to fix that. So something you can do in a content control is you can actually override the on content changed. Now in on content changed, basically you get access to the co the old content and the new content. So what I'm going to do is just quickly, just for a start, just going to just to demonstrate the concept. I'm going to actually um, go and write out a piece of code to do this 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 view selection manually. So for the moment, what I'm doing is I'm saying if it's a one view model, then I'm going to go off and get the one view model template. And this is a data template that's stored in the um, in the app.saml, which is the central place that um, all pages in your application can access templates. And if it's a two view model, then Similarly, I'm going to go and get the two view template and then basically um, set, set those templates to the content template on the content controls. So the content controls have content and they have content templates. It sort of makes sense in that you can see that the template is what's going to actually you know, be used to show that piece of content. Um, and just quickly, just, just, for, just for your reference, you can see here in my, in my um, app.saml I've got the one view template and the two view templates and those two are actually going off and pointing to the actual views that um, are going to be displayed. So now that I have that, that um, uh, piece of content in there, uh, sorry, now that I'm doing like a manual view style view selection, I'm actually able to go through and um, show on the screen without my view model actually knowing what's happened, uh, a, a view. Now given, the way that I've just done it is, is just for example purposes only and you can see that I'm actually am doing a template selection. You certainly wouldn't want to do that in a, in a real application because you're going to get a lot of maintenance that having to keep those if tests going. So in a minute I'll show you how to do that a little bit more automated. But you can see, you remember I had two, two view models. So, and basically the second view model, it's got a text box on it that can go and get a name and then I want to be able to get that name back into the first view model. It's a fairly common scenario when you're working on an application. So I'm going to click get name here. <coughs> Excuse me, and you'll see that it's actually, um, I've, I've got a little reminder to myself in the code to go and, hey, this is where I need to go off and actually um, go and do that piece of work. Now, for the moment, though, we don't actually have a way to navigate to, to the second view model, but in the code that I placed into the, um, into the content control, we certainly have a way to show it if we do navigate to it. Excuse me. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop, stop that running there. And I might go back to our frame, into our main page view model here. And what I might do is I might just paste in a little piece of content here. Uh, sorry, a piece of code. Um, and it's very simple. And first of all, I've added in a navigate, a navigate method here. So rather than setting the current content object here directly, I'm first, I just want to make sure I'm navigating to that. Navigate to the obj, yeah. So the first thing that Navigate's doing is you can see it's actually putting the object onto a stack. So, you know, stacks um, last in, first out, um, a LIFO. And basically, so whatever object I added on last, when I pop stack, it's going to come back off first. So you can see that's a really, really simple way to navigate back and forth. And then when I navigate to, I set the current content object to that object. So the current content object goes out through data binding into the content control. The content control's got that overridden you know, on content change, which then does a template selection for me. And then once again, navigate back, it pops the stack and then does the same thing in reverse, but I'm never doing any sort of template work in here. So if I go off to this guy here, oops, I'm still going to crash. Um, so basically, what I can do then is I'm, I'm like, I want to get a name, and I know that the two view model here is able to do that. So I might just go and explore that for a minute as a developer that's new on this system. I don't know what the view looks like, but I can certainly understand the code. First of all, I can see that it's going to take a, parent, a, uh, a main page model, which is my frame. That to me is, you know, so then this child view model can also navigate around and everything like that. So it's just part of the architecture. We can ignore that. Because in the constructor, I know I have to do that. But the second thing I can see on the constructor there, if I'm going to be the new developer calling this method, uh, calling this thing, is I've got an action callback. And um, basically, the action callback, I can see, takes a string. So to me, that says that I can pass in a little Lambda delegate into that. And when, that, and when it's finished getting the name, it will call back for me, and I'm able to then use that name where I came from. So for those of you who don't know what a, what a <coughs> excuse me, 
if I've had a really horrible cold all week. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know what action callback is, it's basically, it's like passing in a little method like a delegate into here that I can then call without having to know where it came from. So up there I'm passing in, I'm passing in name selected callback up here, and then down here I'm actually just calling it as if it was a method in my own class, and then passing in my name. I just really want to point out right now that I'm hoping that you guys are going where the hell's name coming from and you know where's the view and everything like that because I don't think that we should really care about that. All I have to know is that I've got a name property um, down in here that's obviously being set somewhere and I can see that this, this class has been designed in such a way that when something happens it's going to fire that name back to me but I shouldn't have to really worry about that as the designer of the view model that's calling this guy. So what I'm going to do is go back into one view model into where my not, not implement exception there is. And I'm going to go var model equals new to view model. Pass in the um, parent model, so keeping some sort of hierarchy there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in a little lambda here to go off and, um, to go off and get, that, get that value. And what I might do is I might just set my own title to um, name plus oh, called back and then I'm going to just put in their uh, name. And then I'm going to, of course, navigate back. So parent model dot navigate back. So automatically, um, when, the, when the calling view model goes off and does its thing, I'm going to navigate back to this guy. But it's all asynchronous. <coughs> and then I'm going to, of course, this, um, navigate to the model to start with. So this bit in here is going to happen asynchronously later. So I'm going to navigate to. No, parent model, now we two, the model. Okay, now in the, um, in the two view model, in there, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little breakpoint in here. This is when the actual name selection is happening. I'm gonna run that, and up she pops, and I'm gonna go get name, and I'm gonna type in Jordan, oh, my mouse there, and I'm gonna go select, and first thing I notice is actually it's paused on that line that I had, and this is in two view model, and if I go, uh, if I go and step into that, you can see it's actually popped back into one view model. So my callback got, got affected and then passed through is the actual name that I typed in. Just there like such. So I'll stop that and remove the, the um, breakpoint so you can see that happening quickly. Yeah, so I'll just go in here and go Jordan. You can see that the view is automatically done. There's no code that I wrote that actually did that except when I was working in the content control to start with. So I'm just going to go there and you can see it called back to Jordan. So as a developer working on this project, I can very easily go and use these other view models without having to worry about anything else. Like that was pretty simple to me to do that. It was, that was a piece of code that if I was working on any type of project I'd be able to do. <clears throat> okay, so the next problem we want to deal with is basically if we're going to add in you know, heaps and heaps of views into our application, um, we're going to run into the problem that you know, we've got this high maintenance debt um, we've got this high maintenance debt building up if we have to automatically select templates every time we add a new view and a view model. So you might remember that I said that the um, view model is actually living next to the, to the views. And that's very intentional because we're actually going to enforce a piece of convention um, on the developers on my project. Now first of all, um, the convention is that in, if there's a view model, something view model, it's going to go and look for something view without the model on the end. And what I've actually just pasted in here is a little, is a little um, class that I've got called Content Template Selector Base. And what it does is it basically goes and takes the old content um, and the new content um, for now, just the new content, and basically goes and automatically selects a template for that piece of content. And then applies it based on that convention. So now I can just place, now I can just place a, uh, a, a new view and a view model next to it and navigate to it straight away without actually having to do any w extra work. This thing will figure it out for me. The content template selector base um, is part of the framework that's up on CodePlex that I'll introduce to you guys later. But basically, um, it goes through and figures out the type names and everything like that. And then it goes and checks to see if there's, there's a, um, a view there sitting there for that type and creates it dynamically for you. So now if I run the application, um, once again, it's automatically selecting that view for me but without any of that extra code. So now I don't have to write anything in the view every time I go and do that. <clears throat> okay, 
Okay. So the next the next part I want to look at is once again across in the view. And what I actually want to do is I want to be able to I want to add in transitions now. So a content control, if you go and have a look inside its template, it comes with a default template and you'll see inside it something called a content presenter. So the content control takes the piece of content you pass into its content property, grabs the content template that you also pass into it here. You can see we're doing that dynamically. And it goes and finds the content presenter and gives it the content and the content template. And it's actually the content presenter that goes off and, that, and shows that piece of content on the screen. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to do a few things. Um, we're going to basically add some attributes to the, to the class so that, that tell it that the class can have um, certain visual states using the visual state manager. Um, which is basically a way for designers to say, hey, it's got a, it's got a, um, a normal state, it's got a before navigation state, and all these things. And we're actually able to go into each of the states and then just move stuff around the screen in Blend. And then when I switch to those states later, it'll automatically go and do the transition between those states for us. Uh, Visual State Manager in itself is a whole talk. Um, so I'm just going to paste some stuff up here, like the, the attributes that are on the actual class itself. And basically here you can see I've got quite a few template visual states and I've got normal and I've got um, before transition and things like that. So in the before transition state I'm going to make sure my content's in a certain spot and in the normal I'm going to make sure it's somewhere else. Something else you might notice down the bottom here is I've actually got a couple of template parts. Now template parts similarly to template visual states mean that I can actually go in and define a, a couple of parts that are required by my application, by my control. And in this case I'm going to say um, you need to have a content presenter and an old content presenter. So we need two content presenters now. And this will all show up in Blend automatically, so that way you can just drag these things on and you can edit these templates without having to go back to the developer and saying, what the hell do I need to do in there? So the template parts basically are a couple of parts that I'm going to use to show the old and the new content, and then the states are going to obviously um, work between those. <coughs> And then what I'm going to do is, in my control, I'm going to make sure that I'm consuming those, those template parts there. So I'm going to override on apply template. And then in that on, on, on apply template, I'm going off and finding my content presenter and my old content presenter. And then setting them to some local variables so that way I can reference them quite easily in my app. I don't have to go and find them from the template every time. Just a simple little pattern to make things a little bit quicker. So now I've got access to a couple of content presenters. Um, and the final little part just here is I'm just going to bump in some code. And this is actually the biggest chunk of code in the whole thing. So first of all, <coughs> I'm still doing that same content template selection here, except I'm doing it for old and new. So I've got the content template selector, and I'm getting the new contents template and then passing it into the new content presenter. I'm getting the old contents template and passing it into the old content um, presenter, and then once again setting their content so I'm getting templates matched up to content automatically for me now every time I do it, both old and new. So I'm able to show the old content, which when the transition starts, it should slide off the screen, and the new content will slide in. So you can see we're getting that, that way to do this two-step style transition. And I'll just, whoop, I'll just build that up. And what I'll do is I'll drop into, um, into Expression Blend just quickly. And basically, in Blend, I just want to just demonstrate to you those parts and states in, in action. Okay, building, building, building. <coughs> Excuse me. Nothing like a good cough into a microphone, I see. Okay, so and you'll, the first thing you'll notice here on my screen there is that I've actually got that transition kind of control that I put into my main area. But I'm going to go off and edit its template. And you'll see up here, first of all, I've got those two parts, the content presenters that I need in there. And you see they've both got a tick on them. Um, in those keyboards. There we go. And they've both got a tick on them up there that you can see saying, hey, yes, down here, they're, um, they've already been consumed. So that way, the designer knows, hey, I, I've got these two pieces in there that I require. The other thing that I've got in here is the states. I'm just going to have to zoom out for this bit. Sorry, guys. Um, so the other thing I've got in here is the states. And basically, I've got a normal state here, and in the normal state, if I go and click on Content Presenter, I can see that if I look at the transforms, it's actually been moved off the edge of the screen. But the Content Presenter is sitting there and it's, um, it's in the right spot. But if I go to Before Transition, the Content Presenter, which is basically going to show the new content, is actually moving off to the right of the screen. 
and it's also um, been made um, passive zero and collapsed. So the idea is, is that you can see when I navigate between those two states, they're going to switch spots. One's going to fly off of the screen, the other one's going to fly in. The designer can get in here and muck around with this through all they want and make some really nice looking effects, 3D stuff and all sorts of things. So it is designer friendly. So now when I run up the app, um, you can see it, first of all it slides in. And I'm still navigating in the exact same way, but I've only updated the view to do all this stuff, so my code hasn't changed at all. And um, if we go in there and go into Jordan, and you can see it goes back. So I haven't got a back transition in there at the moment, because it takes a little bit of extra code, obviously, to say, hey, I'm going back or forward, and then passing that information into the view. But for, for um, brevity, you can see that it will work. And that's, that's actually the, um, the main piece there of the first part of the demo, and that's the basic part. What I want to do now is actually um, introduce you to a bit of a framework that I've got up on um, Codeplex that has all these concepts baked into it and make it really, really easy for you, for you to go through and do this sort of stuff. It's a little bit more advanced than the demo we had a look there because it has to do a little bit more work. But what I've got is you can go up to, I'll show you the address soon on the screen. It's called xamlincore.codeplex.com um, and I'll, I'll pop the um, address up at the end of the Prezo. Um, but basically, it's got a little example in it and I'm just going to set that as start up there and run through it. And basically what we've got here is this, it's a really simple Flickr app. And this time, instead of using the left and right transitions, I've got a bit of 3D in there for the transitions. If I go back, you can see it does that and everything like that. Um, using the exact same principles that I just, just demoed to you guys, except taking them and baking them into a bit of a framework that um, basically forces the user to do it. Um, so I go search here, and um, it'll go up to Flickr and, and find all my, my sets. Um, and basically, yeah, I can go in there and, and click a set and everything like that. Once again, though, I'm navigating to the view model, so I'm saying I've got, I've got a, a Flickr user and I want to show their user detail. So I go user detail view model, pass in the Flickr user, navigate to it. I'm thinking about that in a code problem and letting the view problem be somewhere else. So it's actually quite easy to do. Like if you're working on my application and you're like, I need to be able to do, you know, I need to be able to navigate to, say, for example, a photo detail page. And you can see it's not implemented, so I need to be able to, I need to go in there and add that. So first of all, what I might do is I might go and actually add in a new view model in here and a view. So just to demonstrate, just very quickly, um, from scratch, how to actually do this. And this is, this is, I guess, now that we've sort of had a look at how it works, I want to flip across the other side of the story and see how you might consume that as a developer. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to go photo, and I might go, I might go and add a new. Um, a new class here called photo uh, photo detail view, and I'm of course going to make that a user control. And right along beside it, because we're working off that convention I described, I'm going to go photo detail view model view dot model CS. And I've got a little I've got a little registry hack sitting in here that will actually go and put that view model underneath my view, just just like as if it was a um, it's it's uh, code behind. Just neatens things up a little bit. I'm going to of course call this the photo detail view model. Now in this framework we actually do have a distinction between frames and content. So that's good though because um, it, it means that you don't get confused when you're actually writing this stuff out. So in my photo detail view model here, I'm going to code this so that way we can show a couple of photos. Um, first of all I'm going to need access to a Flickr photo. Um, so I'm going to call that photo and I'm going to need a Flickr photo instance. Now if you've ever worked with the Flickr API um, your photos have the information about the photo and the metadata, but the instances ha are all the different sizes, you know, thumbnail, small, medium, large, and everything like that. So I'm going to have a particular instance that I show. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to convert these into properties because we know we have to access these through data binding. And I'm actually using Resharper here to do this a little bit quicker. Um, so, normally. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go off to the instance here and do the same thing for that. And now that, now that I've exposed those, I'm able to um, obviously data bind to those. And just something else, in the framework, because we're able to do quite a, a few interesting extra things and force the developer to do in a certain way, and also um, there's some serialization stuff around Tombstone, I'm actually using factories to build the, um, the view model. So instead of using constructor, I never, I never use a constructor in here. I use on initial, overize on initialize because of the ordering that things need to actually run in this. And I've just got a little piece of code that I'm going to paste in there that's just basically it takes the photo um, that's passed in 
and ensures that um, I pick, pick out an instance there. So it's just a little piece of housekeeping there to make sure we've actually got an instance to show. So the uninitialize in this case is, is how we do things, and that's for a number of reasons around serialization and, um, and ordering and stuff. Part of the framework, you can check it out. Like, I don't want to go too much into that. It's such a minor, such a minor point, and, and it's quite easy to get around. In the photo detail view here, so sorry, just just to, before I confuse um, you guys and run too fast, you can see that all I did is create a couple of properties in my view model. I mean, it makes sense. Something somewhere is going to consume that later on, and we're, we're about to show that now. But I mean, a view model isn't that scary, really. I mean, I'm showing a Flickr photo. It's just an entity with with um, a couple of properties in it. So I'm going to go back in here, and I need something to show this guy. So I'm going to go binding uh, source equals binding um, instance, which is the Flickr photo instance dot source. And I might just go. I might just stretch this guy so that it's you know stretching out to uniform fill, so it takes up the screen. And that's my view done. So this is. I'm now able to transition to this guy, and I've got all that photo stuff set up and ready to go um, in the view model. Now let's just drop into the. Uh, not handle not even an exception there, and um, so I need to I need to be able to navigate off to this other view model. So I'm going to go var model equals create content model. Remember I said I was using factories, and this is great because I'm actually forcing the developer to remember to do this every time. So now it forces them into the path of my of my um, system. So every time they're doing this, it's all the same across my entire application. Plus it's self-documenting. So I just go here and I go uh, new Flickr uh, photo. It's called photo detail view model there. And remember I was saying that I've got some crazy stuff in there to work around um, serialization and anything like that. And that, that means that everything has to be set through properties. And so what I can do in here is basically uh, new model. is basically going here and I'll just go um, new model dot photo equals selected item dot photo. Okay, so the uninitialize will always be run after this. So it's like it's like a little initializer in C sharp. It's just a little bit a little bit different because of the way the factories are built. And I found this to be the best way to do it actually. Even though I guess on initial inspection it looks like it's a little bit more difficult than using constructor. I actually found it's more efficient to run things through um, through factories, uh, especially on larger projects when all of a sudden you've got people doing things in slightly different ways. I'm going to navigate to the model. Okay, so. That's all I had to write, like that, that little piece of code. And all of a sudden, my system will do the rest for me, forward and backward transitions and everything like that. So I'll go in and find the user again. Check out my name. Catch 10. I need to be very particular about the photo sets that I show you guys. And I click on there, and you can see instantly goes off and navigates to that, that new view model. Um, and then the view and the transitions and the titles and everything like that and the back buttons and, and all that junk happened for me. And just another little thing is the way it's all come, come together, so if I have a look at this and then go through to one of these guys here and then go back, you can see it's actually still loading. So because that stayed in, in the navigation history and it's actually able to still keep processing. There's all sorts of events in there to make sure that you don't um, you know when you've been activated and deactivated and stuff like that to make sure you're background processing, but yeah, it's, um, it's, all, it's all come together automatically for me. So that's about all I, uh, all I have to demo today. Um, I, as I promised, I would put the, um, the Xamarin Core Codeplex address up there for you guys to go and, and pull apart, see how I've done it. Um, if, you, if you feel like it, you can go in there and you can, you can update and everything. I think it's open, so I, encourage, I want this to start a discussion. I want people to come up and talk about it and everything like that because I think it really needs. I think it's an area that a lot of projects are failing on, um, and basically, I'd really, really like to see you guys, especially in your first civil life process, not face plant, and to have this really great um, story going on um, down the track. So I think I think that's about everything I've got for you guys today. Um, I know that there's drinks on after this, so. I'd